This session is being brought to you by SAA's Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards, TSES. My name is Kerstin Arnold, and I'm the EAD team lead at TSES at the moment. My co-host today is Noah Huffman, member of TSES and the EAD team, who will be taking note of your questions throughout the session. And we also have Corey Neimer, co-chair of TSES outreach team, and Beth Coop from the ES section steering committee supporting us with all the administration around today's event. Today's session will be focusing on various scenarios of using EAD and will function as one stepping stone in TSES engagement with the community in the context of the upcoming major revision of the standard. I'd like to introduce our three panelists and speakers for today. Karen Bredenberg, TSES co-chair, will give us a quick introduction into TSES and what we're working with in the team. Next up, we have Lindsay Loper from UMBC in Baltimore, followed by Ada Negraro from the Southern Methodist University in Dallas. And rounding up our panel for today will be Greg Wiedemann, University at Albany, the State University of New York. Karen, may I ask you to take the stage, please? Thank you, Kirsten. So if you take the next slide for me, please. And maybe one more. So thank you. So as you heard, we are TSEIS and we did a webinar a year ago where you can find the background of who we are and what we really are doing. Uh, and it's already available on YouTube. So next slide. What we do and work with are, as you know, and why you are here is for listening about EID, but you can find more about us in a number of places. So we have a microsite at the uh, archivist uh, webpage, so on the top link. Uh, we also do all our work in GitHub, so you really can see and follow and give comments along the whole time and the whole process. Um, Focus today is EID, and that is, uh, is published on the Library of Congress webpage. I think you know it by now. It has been around for a long time and since the previous versions. Uh, they are also graciously hosting our mailing list. So uh, even if it says EID, we also cover EACC CPF there. And EAC CPF is published at SAS Bibliothek Berlin. And besides communicating with us through GitHub. We do have an mailing list, uh, the mailing list, and we also you can also use our form and report through the SAA webpage. So lots of ways to connect with us besides attending our webinars. So next slide. So Karsten did talk a little bit and say a couple of sentences, but uh, the standards we are maintainers of have a revision cycle. So annually, there are smaller, minor releases that take care of mostly bugs or we fix uh, spelling errors. Uh, that happens every year. But every fifth year, following the guidelines from FIA and the Standards Committee, we start a major revision. And the session today is part of starting up that revision gathering insights and seeing really what's going on and what we can make better. So Karsten, I'm not going to steal any more time from the session. You take over and take us through this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, for this quick introduction on TSES and our work. I'll stop sharing my screen and I will give the floor to Lindsay as the first of our three panelists. Thank you. Nice to see everyone today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, all right. I'm also going to turn my video off just so you don't see me reading my notes, but I will be here. If I can. Here we go. All right. So thank you. Yeah, my name is Lindsay Laper. Um, I'm at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, just outside of Baltimore. 
Um, and I'm going to be talking today about a project that's a couple of years old now, um, but basically where we're working to repurpose our descriptive data across um, different platforms. So there's a link here. Um, I think they're also going to put it in the chat and I have it throughout this bit.ly link. Any descriptive manuals, templates, spreadsheets, um, anything I mentioned in this presentation is linked on this page. Um, you'll see all of our finding aids here and at the very bottom, there's a whole section on our EAD XML um, work at UMBC. All right, so before we had EAD at UMBC, um, this was kind of what our finding aid description looked like. Um, I'm going to use collection level and single level um, kind of interchangeably, um, as well as multi-level and finding aids also interchangeably. Um, so we have Pest Perfect at UMBC. Um, our catalog librarians were creating MARC records, and then we had our finding aids hosted on our website. The biggest problem with this is that there was no way to move that data from one of these platforms to another. We really were doing it all by hand, um, even going from our Word documents to the PHP to put it online. It was a lot of copy and paste, um, a lot of room for mistakes, and just super time consuming, um, which meant we had a huge backlog because um, no one wanted to do that, including me. <laughs> So in 2014, we were awarded a grant by NHPRC to implement um, this EAD XML compliant workflow. Honestly, th the real goals with this grant were to get rid of that collection description backlog. So making sure that we had at least collection level records for all of our archival collections, um, whether they were unprocessed or new accessions, um, which we did not have before. And then also making sure that that data could really move from one platform to another um, without a lot of intervention, you know, and having to do that copy. But we had other goals, they're listed here. Um, so the first step in this project was really looking at all of our descriptive fields and making sure that we were structuring it so that it would work across these different platforms. Um, this is an example of something that we put together for each of those fields. This is our arrangement field. Um, so we were basically saying like, this is exactly how we're going to write and format this description in Pass Perfect so that it will then be able to use, be used with EAD, with MARC, without having to change anything. Um, formatting for us was really important because um, with the, the process where we were using these XSLT spreadsheets, even like punctuation, sometimes that was what would signal the XSLT spreadsheet to split a field or put it in a certain area. Um, so we really had to be really specific in, how, in terms of what we were, how we were entering the data into these. This is what our workflow ended up looking like. Um, so we create our collection level records in Pass Perfect. They have a Pass Perfect XML, um, which is very basic, um, but it's XML. So we're able to export that and using an XSLT spreadsheet, transform that into EAD3. Um, our catalog librarians also use um, an XSLT spreadsheet to transform it into MARC XML. We then take the EAD XML and we're able to, again, um, we actually have like a batch processor for this that was built as part of our grant. Um, and that creates the PHP for our online finding aid. So the only kind of intervention needed by me is to just run these XSLT spreadsheets or style sheets. Um, and I will say just very briefly, um, since we're talking about EAD3, <laughs> why we have EAD3 at UMBC, um, and it's really the timing of it. So the bulk of our work was being done in 2015, 2016, when EAD3 was coming out. So we didn't want to use the older format and then have to go through and update 
everything. Um, so that's why we're using it. This is an example of how we're able to repurpose um, some of this descriptive information across these different platforms. So the top example is the XML that comes out of PassPerfect. Um, this is PassPerfect XML, which is really just the field names. That's what they put in there. But it's something, and we can take that, um, and the middle field is our EAD XML. Um, you can see in the top example where we've put that semicolon after our inclusive date, that signals the XSLT to split that into um, the inclusive and the bulk fields. And then at the bottom, um, we kind of slim it down. <laughs> this is our PHP um, example that would be, um, this is probably like a series description. This is an example of the XSLT. I'm not going to go over this because I'm sure it's really small on your screen, um, but it does just show you again that semicolon is really kind of how it splits everything up. It's also adding some of our mark fields. Um, yeah, the XSLT does a lot of work um, in this process. All right, so there is still room for improvement. Um, I have on here, this is an example of how our subjects are exported using PassPerfect XML. Um, actually, in PassPerfect, we can enter a lot of um, information in terms of what the SORI we're using for our subjects, if it's a local term, if it's TGM, something like that. But none of that is actually exported with the XML. So if we want that information included, um, which we do in EAD and definitely in MARC, we actually have to go in and hand code all of that all over again. Um, there's also, because we're going from single level to a potentially a multi-level description when the finding aid, anything that's expanded beyond that collection level, we have to hand code that as well. So we're, if we have an expanded um, biographical note or um, container list, for example, we're then putting that in directly into the EAD um, ourselves. I will say, I think I saw Dave on here, but we have a great, um, we actually use the Naval Academy's container list workflow um, that's able to automate our container list from Excel into EAD. So I just wanna give Dave a shout out for that because we still use that. All right, so after this process, this is now, um, all of our access points. So we were able to retain all of the ones that we had before. Um, we've added a few more. Um, we do have our EAD XML files available on our website. So if you wanted to look at those um, and they're crawled by a couple of um, different services. Um, yeah. So we can really go from that past perfect online collection level record um, and expand it out to um, all of these other kind of access points without having to copy and paste or, you know, kind of move that data ourselves. We can automate it. And that's it. Um, so I will turn my video back on. And yeah, so again, um, that bit.ly link, you can find all of the templates that I mentioned, our batch processor examples. Um, are all there. And then we also have GitHub um, if you want to download files from there as well. Okay, thanks very much for this, Lindsay. Can I ask Ada to take the stage next, please? On a microphone. Okay, better now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ada Negraru, and I am Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I am going to talk about the use of EAD 2002 
um, at our institution. So Southern Methodist University is a medium-sized private university in Dallas. Uh, and our special collections uh, include uh, three different libraries, um, as well as the university archives. And uh, they um, house um, different types of materials, such as rare books, manuscripts, photographs, un the university archives, corporate records, artwork, mixed media, and so on. And these resources are made available to the end users to three different types of formats, um, mark bibliographic records, uh, digitized uh, collections, and um, EAD finding aids. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the use of VAD 2002 finding aids at our institution. Um, so EAD 2002 was uh, adopted um, at SMU back in the early 2000s. And we discovered that it still uh, serves pretty well um, our archivists and researchers alike. Um, our finding aids are, are, of course, written according to the DAX rules uh, and are published on the web, on a website uh, maintained by uh, the Texas Archival Resources Online or Tarot Consortium and also uh, harvested by Archive Grid. And uh, I'm not going to share the link to the consortium because the website is uh, completely changing all, uh, this summer and we are in the process of having a uh, different URL. So it would not be relevant to share the link to it right now. Um, now, how does the process work? Um, it's pretty simple actually, but it, is uh, relevant to us. Um, there are four factors that uh, contribute to the implementation of EAD 2002 um, at SMU. And those are teamwork or collaboration. We have a campus-wide EAD working group formed by um, all of the archivists working on campus. Um, the curator of photographs and the digital pre preservation librarian. Um, we review each other finding aids, uh, advise each other on a variety of issues, anything from the use of certain elements in a finding aid to all the way to formatting and anything in between. Uh, we communicate uh, via shared, uh, shared network drive through email and as needed group meetings, although those have been quite infrequent during the pandemic. Um, now, uh, we do keep each other informed about uh, what we're working on, uh, what stage each uh, collection we're working on is that whether it's the processing stage or the finding aid stage. And uh, when to expect a finding aid to be presented to the group for review. Um, now uh, we have a set of responsibilities uh, regarding the finding aid creation, the authority terms, those are added to finding aids by our archivist who is also uh, a cataloging librarian. Uh, the revision of finding aids, and then we coordinate on when they, uh, the finding aids are ready to be uh, encoded and posted online. Um, and then we have a uh, defined uh, and well-established workflow uh, regarding um, uh, the evolution of a finding aid from creation to publication. Now, um, how more about the workflow. Um, so uh, finding aids start um, 
with um, a word document uh, created by an intern or the archivist uh, or a student assistant. Uh, and the finding aid is created using the AD2002 template in Word. And then after um, it, um, it goes uh, through the review stage um, and the control access terms are added, the finding aid is encoded. Um, we do that in-house. Um, hand encoding using the oxygen software and then um, the finding aid is published online uh, through the Taro server which will become a um, website. Uh, now uh, speaking of templates, um, as I mentioned, uh, EAD 2002 is used to um, create the finding aid templates, whether that is uh, in Word as a, a text document or um, using the EAD DDT schema in Oxygen. Uh, we found that um, this serves us well because it integrates well with the uh, Taro uh, consortium um, style sheets. And this type of template also includes all the needed des descriptive elements um, that are um, uh, that describe our collection, such as title creator and so on. Um, the Word uh, finding a template uh, is well used by the archivists, the interns and student assistants. Um, and uh, it's a very simple, straightforward training process for the uh, interns and student assistants to learn what uh, they need to uh, include in a finding aid. Um, it also offers enough depth for a collection description without being overwhelming and researchers find what they need to know about our collections from uh, this type of template. Um, and then we also found that uh, EAD 2002 is flexible enough to accommodate uh, any changes that we need to make. Uh, for example, we had to uh, include uh, a note for about a sensitive materials in our restrictions um, section of the finding gates, we could do that easily in two, uh, EAD 2002. Um, now, um, the, uh, at the encoding phase, uh, the DTT schema template um, is also pretty straightforward. Um, and um, since we do in-house uh, encoding, uh, it has been the case that uh, some of our archivists or student assistants needed to learn how to encode by hand and having a well enough structured um, template in XML uh, was pretty easy to, uh, teach to our uh, staff or um, student assistants, with, again, without being too overwhelming. Um, the schema itself um, changed um, um, throughout time, unlike the um, Word uh, document, uh, the Word template. Uh, but uh, we were able to incorporate any changes um, and uh, such as um, um, element, element attributes or child elements uh, as required by um, the state consortium Taro. Now, um, are we ever going to uh, move to EAD3? Because this is um, obviously the standard that, um, that the archival world is um, going uh, 
to adopt or um, in, in the future, whether that is near or not is, is to be determined. Um, well, um, EAD3 has been considered at our institution, actually two or three of our archivists um, uh, took EAD3 uh, courses offered by the Society of American Archivists. And um, in the end, we decided that for now, EAD 2002 does serve our purpose as well. Um, we found that EAD3 is too structured um, and it is uh, time consuming. Um, we, it would require us to change all our templates uh, to incorporate the EAD3 elements and that would uh, impact um, our workflows um, and also impact our workload because taking time to adapt uh, to EAD3 would mean not being able to uh, do the rest of our jobs, including uh, collection processing uh, and description. And in the end, that would impact our users as well because our collections would not be available for research um, as soon as we want to. Um, and there is also uh, the cost involved. Um, honestly, SAA uh, classes um, are not that cheap. And it would mean uh, that all archivists working with a collection description uh, would need to take uh, EAD3 coursework and uh, that cost, uh, I wouldn't say is prohibitive, but uh, is not affordable either. Uh, now, on the other hand, um, we might consider EAD3 in the future given um, the linked data um, that is adopted by the archival work. Um, also, if user expectations change and uh, more uh, data is needed uh, in uh, is going to be needed in the future. Um, and also um, if EAD3 will be the required standard in order to continue participation in the various um, uh, networks that we are a part of, um, including Taro, Archive Grid, and Napan. And I thank you for your uh, attention. I mean, going to stop sharing my screen here. Thank you very much for this, Ada. And uh, we'll hand over to Greg as the last of our speakers. Please, Greg. Ah, there's the unmute button. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Greg. I'm the University Archivist at UAlbany. And I'm going to talk about moving EAD towards a common data model. Um, these talks are framed around my our experience with EAD, and I'm fortunate that my experience comes both from traditional archival processes and hand, code, hand coding EAD, to also building tools around EAD and serving as an advisor to our state level aggregator Empire ADC. Um, I'm not saying this is necessarily so you should listen to me, but I think that I'm really fortunate to have this experience um, with working with both sides of EAD, and I think that's where a lot of this perspective comes from. Um, so I want to talk about the promise of EAD, that like original like sort of ethos. And this is a quote from the original Berkeley Finding Aids project in 94 that says, uh, an encoding standard would guarantee that machine readable finding aids created today would be usable tomorrow. And that was kind of the original promise. There'd be like one final format. And once you're encoded your description, you're good. Um, it would be structured, future proof, and you'd be able to easily move it between systems. Now I don't want to like undermine the success of EAD it has been really successful in like making our description usable in many ways, but we've also found that it's kind of limiting at all of these things. So I think we really need to give up on this dream that we're going to have this one final format forever and it sort of embrace a common data model instead. And the reason for this is that um, our archival systems are still kind of really limited. We have some success um, archive space and there's some other successful tools out there. But also front end usability for archival description is still a problem. Um, 
there's not really an archival system for managing digital objects. Most systems now require like item level metadata. Um, and even for the successful like um, tools like ArchivesSpace, funding and sustainability are still challenges. And this is important because as the data structure standard, EAD sort of defines how these systems work with the archival description. And this is a problem because it's really hard to build systems to work around EAD. Um, I'm not going to go too into this because I think this is pretty documented elsewhere. Um, but fundamentally, like EAD was designed for a different purpose that we're often using it today. It was designed to mark up a, a, a document, essentially, instead of um, having discrete data elements and moving it between systems. And EAD3 actually made some really uh, incremental improvements on these uh, problems, but also it, in working with it kind of adds more variability because they left a lot of the unstructured elements in two to ease migration pat patterns. Now developers have to work with both the unstructured and structured elements. So it doesn't really solve the overall problem. So fundamentally, EAD is kind of a lossy medium. Um, it doesn't really have strict rules governing how your data is um, and the structure of it. So we often in the profession talk about migration problems, moving data in between systems. Well, I really want to argue that these are kind of EAD problems because EAD sort of lacks this structure. Um, oftentimes, we're taking data that's pretty well well um, conformed to, um, and with a set of rules from one system, exporting it to EAD, which is really loose and unstructured, and then putting it into another system with a bunch of structure again. So EAD is kind of a weak point in that. Um, and this is an example from Empire ADCR, New York State level aggregator, where we're using sort of a archipelago based form tool to, for small repositories to create their description. And that is structured, it's based in Drupal, so it has rules without any data. It gets exported to EAD and then gets re uh, indexed into ArcLight, which has a different set of rules. So EAD sort of is the where the, a lot of these problems can arise. And this is why EAD is kind of really limiting for aggregators. Um, raw EAD that's either hand encoded or using a local authoring tool can be really challenging to index because it requires skilled labor to make it consistent. And a lot of the consortial based aggregators really don't have that extra skilled labor. Um, so aggregators kind of push people towards often um, consistent EAD, like from tools like ArchivesSpace, which is great, but not all repositories are a really good fit for ArchivesSpace, particularly smaller repositories that might not get a lot of the advantages out of a tool like ArchivesSpace. So I mentioned before, Empire EDC is trying using this archival based form tool to sort of fit this, but it kind of doesn't solve the overall problem. So what I think is we need to do is move our XML standard um, our XML format to a data model instead. We need to accept that our description is going to live in multiple formats and systems over time and focus on standardizing the structure of our data, not necessarily the format. So I'll show you um, sort of what this looks like through like one of these data issues with EAD. And this is uh, an issue with dates. So this is how dates are in archive space. There's there's a type field which with three, um, uh, three uh, values, bulk dates, inclusive dates, or single dates. So the issue with that is both EAD 2002 and EAD 3 have type or unit date type elements, but they only use bulk or inclusive. These elements aren't sort of designed to define structure like ArchivesSpace is doing. So ArchivesSpace just exported single unit dates without that type attribute, which seems like a really defensible decision. The problem is when it gets um, uh, imported into ArcLight, which it might in the future, um, ArcLight does something different with that data. It keeps them in the dates in discrete fields, but also combines them with a title into this normalized title field. And that's what it sort of displays to the heading to the user, um, which also can make a lot of sense. Um, but there was originally a bug in archive space that it assumed that EAD components only had one date, which actually I think is a really easy assumption to make because it's really not that explicit in um, the tag library that you can have multiple unit dates per component. And if you pull a lot of examples of EAD, you'll actually find many of them only have one date per component. Um, so that got fixed, but then it kind of expected there to have this type element, either inclusive or bulk. So uh, ones without would just be placed at the end. So you get this example below where all of the dates would kind of be out of order. The single dates would be at the end of the date range. So this is not a huge deal, and that's a problem that will, is pretty easy fixed, but really it's a misunderstanding between tools that was fostered by EAD because EAD does not clearly define the structure of dates. So we don't really have this conversation about what our dates look like and structure. So what this would look like is uh, for a, to move to a common data model is instead of a format to focus on a set of rules. So this is for every component can have um, ha 
have any number of unit dates. And unit dates might have a set of fields that have all uh, limited in like what values they could have. So some fields might have ISO compliant dates, some might be on structured description. So this would be outlined in the abstract. So then data that conforms to this date, this abstract data model can be expressed in JSON. And this is sort of a stripped down version of what comes out of the archive space API, or it can be expressed in EAD 2002, and it's the same data. Or can it be expressed using the new unit date structured elements in EAD3? Um, and it's relatively easy to move that data back and forth. So what I'm saying is that I think the serialization part and how we're we're adding these into a format is actually easier, and that we should let the technologists and the developers like handle that problem and rely on common conventions that will sort of come out um, to sort of uh, structure um, these take these the structured data model and put it into an implementation. And that could be EAD 2002, EAD3, JSON, or even things like spreadsheets, which is kind of exciting. So and I think we already are relying on conventions for, for how we're using EAD. This is an example that particularly bugs me. So these are two examples of a valid um, extent element in EAD 2002, right? Now, the second example, which uses uh, puts cubic feet in a units attribute, is actually more structured, right? It like is a better encoding from an XML perspective. Yet, um, if you try to import that into archive space or ArcLight, both of them will ignore the units attribute. They don't recognize it. Instead, they focused on recognizing the first uh, um, space in the just extent field to separate the units and the, the, the um, number. So, and the only reason for this is that this was a convention established by the um, EAD toolkit in the late 90s, and everyone essentially copied from that. So we're already relying on these conventions as part, as part of our practice. So if we standardize our structure, then we can really rely on, I think we can rely on these conventions for, for structuring our data and implementations. I also think this is a more inclusive approach, right? We don't want to like develop, make these like decisions going forward based on uh, large repositories. Uh, we really want to make um, it more easier for the workflows for smaller repositories. Uh, and I think we the the resistance to a lot of this structure that would be required is because they don't want to make we don't want to make small repositories go through the structure, right? But I think we're also not being honest with small repositories to say that if you conform to the scheme, your data is good. I think migration will still be required at some point if you want to get more out of your data or present it to your users in a sort of dynamic way. Um, going to a common data model might lower the cost of the systems and implementation uh, integrations a bit, which can help. And really excitingly, it allows for new possibilities for implementations for smaller repositories. So we've had discussions um, around um, in Empire EAC about using Google Forms. So smaller repositories for collection level description could just use Google Forms to enter their, their collection level description. It could go into a Google spreadsheet and we can index that data into ArcLight directly. Technically, it's pretty relatively easy to do, but it might sort of be a dead end for the data because we don't have a common uh, data model to structure that data. But if we had a common data model that can conform to and a convention for holding that data in a spreadsheet, it might be a viable approach. And like, so it, it makes a lot of these different sort of more ad hoc tools possible. And also, I think it will allow for more broader particip professional participation. A lot of the people that are making the decisions around how our just archival description works in practice are either involved in archive space or are working for a repository, well-resourced repositories, right? So I think if we move to an abstract data model, I think it allows a broader um, body of archivists to participate in these conversations without technical skills or experience. Um, so that's why I think, um, I think it's useful to think about EAD moving from a, 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 an XML standard towards a common data model. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much for this, Greg. So I think there were some really interesting points in there. Um, just want to check, Noah, have there been any questions for any of our presenters directly? Um, yeah, we had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I can go ahead and read those out, um, or at least one of them. This came up uh, during Ada's presentation. Um, and the question was, um, I think Ada made a comment about um, EAD3 might be better for linked data. And the question was just um, if, if anyone could expand on why EAD3 is better for linked data. Um, they said, Rick, oh, I understand, but EAD, I don't quite understand. Well, um, 
Yeah, that's actually uh, what uh, makes us be a little reluctant or more than a little reluctant to adopt EAD3 is that at the moment it does not serve linked data well, whether it will do that in the future will uh, you know, consider looking into it, but I agree um, uh, RIG is a better um, standard or format for uh, linked open data. Thank you. I hope that, that answered the question. Was there anything else in the chat, Noah? Yeah, there was a follow-up question. Um, um, could, could you give an example of a user expectation that EAD3 could satisfy, maybe that EAD2002 could not satisfy? I think that's what the context for the question was. Um, well, um... Possibly the type of data offered by EAD3 um, being uh, more structured that, than EAD2002 would um, offer more information that the users could, um, the end users could, um, you know, access. Um, for us, it's not of an issue right now, but uh, uh, I would think that EAD3, for example, uh, uses a better integration of DAO uh, digital archival objects that uh, EAD2002 is not as well prepared to handle. Uh, for us, this is not an issue because we host our digital archival objects on a completely different platform and just link to that from our finding aids simply from our related materials section but for for other uh, you know purposes or if we uh, ever want in the future to integrate those in our uh, finding aids, then um, EAD3 might, might be a better uh, standard. Okay, thank you for this as well. Um, just checking if there are any, any questions that anyone would like to ask directly. Um, so as, as mentioned at the beginning, uh, you should have the possibility to raise your hand or you can still post them to the chat. We had another question coming in for the panelists. Um, might it be possible to use both EAD 2002 and EAD3 at the same time? Or could another revision of EAD address issues from updating by combining the benefits of both into one version. Does any one of our panelists want to take that, that question? Um, I can sort of, I think I can take that. I mean, you try, probably want to avoid having two different uh, XML standards just because you want one consistent like place for your data. But I think that's sort of the approach that I'm advocating for is that if we, um, if we standardize our description and like the structure of it outside of the actual tools, we can actually put that data in different places. So theoretically, you can have the same data in one source, and you could put it in both EAD 2002 and EAD 3, depending on whatever situation is mo most, most helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say one quick thing. So in turn, thinking about if we had two different versions, um, using the workflow at UMBC, I think that we could, we would just need to basically have all new templates um, created. So I think that we could do that, but if it, it would have to be something where you're starting a new system and that's what you're using going forward. Um, but yeah, it would just require updating everything. Yeah, I'm just, just seeing the um, comment from R Brigitte uh, in, in the chat about um, EAD RIC, uh, so an EAD version compatible with RIC. Um, I think that's, that's certainly something that is on our uh, list in terms of the major revision. Um, 
maybe that's that's another question for for you, Greg, as as you were also kind of looking at this from from the data model point of view. What are your views in terms of kind of aligning EAD and RIC? Um, so I don't I don't think you'll be able to like merge the standards necessarily because they are different. They do different things in like the actual format. But like conceptually, yeah, you can like sort of that's sort of what I'm advocating for. If you have a, like a, a common like standard way of structuring the data, you can put it in both places. But that would talk about like really need some new conversations about dates and other things and like how they're actually structured. Um, and this is kind of similar to the approach Rick is taking, right? There's a concept, Rick CM, which is the Rick conceptual model. And then there's Rick O, which is the Rick ontology, which is like the link data, like in triples for actually encoding data. So it's kind of the similar approach, yet the, if you look at the Rick um, data model, it's not actually a data model, it's a conceptual model. It's, it does outline fields of elements, but it doesn't really, and it does talk about how they relate, but it doesn't really like talk about to the, the level of precision a data model would use. Like their dates might have a date range, a single date, but it doesn't say like what that qualifies for essentially. Um, and I'm also kind of resistant that Rick is going to solve this problem just because they seem to be taking a very like older approach to stand to, to standardization. Like I think how um, what. Uh, TS EAS is doing and TS DAX have been doing it, like moving for more open standards development. And I think they're taking a more older approach that is sort of like, we're going to sit and figure out this problem for you. And then we're going to release this to you. And I think that's a, uh, like, that's kind of why I'm skeptical of their approach, where I think where uh, the American group base groups like TS EAS and TS um, DAX and things are taking a more like open approach that is more participatory because I think uh, the best ideas don't necessarily come from the experts, right? Which is sort of part of what uh, TA ESS is holding these sessions for, right? Definitely, yeah. That's that's a good point. I mean, that's that's essentially our approach with regard to the EAD revision, specifically in the context of um, the the simple fact that that we have both versions of EAD being used still in the community, um, and I mean, we know they are they are. To some extent similar, but to some extent very different, um, and I think it will be tricky to kind of align things. Um, so I think the the data model uh, approach that you presented in in your uh, talk, Greg, is certainly something that we will uh, gonna have a look at. But again, we also depend on the input from the community, um, and so I think it, it's been really great to kind of see these different approaches that that you've taken. Um, Lindsay Arda, did one of you want to comment on, on the question of, of Rick and uh, potential kind of alignments or, or comparisons with EAD? Um, so I guess I should have mentioned at the beginning, I'm, I'm now a reference and instruction archivist. <laughs> so description is kind of off my plate. So I'm not really familiar with Rick. So I'll leave that to Greg and Ada. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. We do not quite use RIC as well. And um, like Lindsay, I am not very familiar with it. I sort of, uh, you know, um, look at uh, what uh, the archival world is doing with it, but that does not mean um, it has been adopted um, at SMU. So I would let Greg talk about it if uh, that's in more um no. I just posted the links in the chat to the two Rick CM, which Rick stands for records and context. Um so if anyone wants to learn more, it's coming out of the experts group on archival description, which I believe is like the same group that originally came up with ISAD, ISAD G in like the 90s. Yeah, so, so uh, the expert group on archival descriptions is, is a group um, at the International Council on Archives. Um, so um, I think there probably might still be a few people around that there were around when Isaac G and, and all the others uh, were, were um, conceptually given birth to. Um, but uh, I think there also are some new people in there, definitely. Um, one other question that I had and that we also discussed in the previous session that we had on Wednesday with the panelist over there. I mean, specifically, uh, Lindsay and Ada, you described kind of your workflows. Um, and while you do have 
templates and, and XSLT scripts that help you with certain things. Um, there still are kind of parts where you obviously need to kind of be hands on um, and, and adapt things. Um, so what are these parts specifically? And is there something that TSES could do in order to kind of, I don't know, make life easier in, in future versions um, that, that there's not so much hands on work required? can start. So I think for us in terms of the, the work that we're still doing that's hands-on is mostly because we're starting in a system where we can only create a collection level record. Um, and so when we want to expand that and have, you know, the multi-level finding aid, that's where we would then need to enter that in. Um, I know that there are other systems like archive space where you are starting with that multi-level description. Um, so that might eliminate some of that. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's the main thing for us. And then, I mean, I also mentioned our container lists. So we're building them in Excel and then kind of going through this process to have them reformatted um, into EAD and like, in theory, that's very hands off because it really is just the programs kind of doing the work. Um, but if there was something more direct, you know, if there's something like Excel or another spreadsheet tool that people kind of gravitate towards to build a, something like a container list, and if there was like a really easy plugin or something like that to make it into EAD, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with Lindsay. Um, you know, any kind of guidance regarding the simplification of the process would be appreciated as well as um, any um, tutorials that could apply to, uh, you know, a wide range of institutions uh, would be helpful. Uh, now, there is a point where we, do want to be hands-on because uh, we want to be, of course, familiar with the collections that um, we hold and help our users. And um, our descriptions vary from uh, probably series level down to item level, depending on the case. So um, it's, uh, I would say it, it varies. So any kind of guidance, would be appreciated as well as a way to plug in the uh, container list if such a thing exists. Thank you. Greg, any thoughts from you? Because you said at the beginning that you've kind of have experience for the hands-on and the work with tools around EAD. So, sorry, what was the original question again? Well, the original question was uh, whether kind of the, the parts where you have to get hands on is something where TZS could do something differently uh, in future to, to kind of reduce the manual work. Yeah, so I, I think it would be wonderful if Archivist didn't have to hand encode XML. Like that's such a, like a skilled thing. And I think the reason that archivists like enjoy uh, working with XML is like, because they don't really have, oftentimes archivists don't have access to like the technologists to do it other ways. So XML is something they can do themselves, which is like really empowering. So I like, I would imagine a world, world that like archivists didn't have to do that work, but can be empowered using other tools, whether it's like forms or spreadsheets or things like that. So I think also just like by focusing on like the conceptual, like the data model behind, yeah, like you can have your, your your same templates and your same um, EAD 2002 or EAD 3, but if you have the conversation about the data models, like what does a date look like? Like what, what's a date range? What's a single date? Like that sort of conception will be like, I think really helpful in clearing up like where they go and what fields. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. We are at the end of our session. So um, just one last check if there are any kind of burning questions from from the audience. Um, otherwise, um, thank you very much to, to the three presenters. Uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us today. 
Um, as mentioned at the beginning, we will be posting the recording of this session along with the slides um, on SAA's YouTube. Um, and also there's a, a quick survey in terms of any feedback or suggestions that you might have. If you could take some few minutes to fill that out, that would be much appreciated. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day and good evening.